95 when we made the first Only Built for Cuban Links part two. Um, you know, when we made that album, we basically came in with everything and anything that we learned from the streets and we applied it to the music and the sound that RZA was creating. You know, that album to me was a, just a stepping stone for me to express all the things that I'm around and everything that I've done. You know, and when we made it, it was like, you know, we wasn't worrying about no a and We didn't have people in our face to tell us, yo, make this kind of record or make that, or we need a hook or whatever. It's like a lot of our songs probably didn't have hooks and especially Cuban Links. Like, you know, we had a few, but it wasn't something that I was in love with. You know what I mean? You know, it was all about lyrics and beats back then, like real high content, driven lyrical gunplay, strong beats production made Wu-Tang style. <laughs> All I could do is just sit here and look back at the videotapes of what we did on the Purple Joint and just apply it to my growth today. Me being that I've been through so much and being on the block for damn near half my life, it's some things you'll never forget. You know what I mean? It's like a barber. You know, he may be cutting hair for five years and then take a break for 10. He still know what to do with the clippers when it's time to go in. You can only lack in it, you can't lose it. So that's how I feel about making Cuban Links 2 again. You know what I mean? Is that I know the path that I had once went down and I know how the production was being made. So all we did was just want to flash y'all back and make y'all feel the vibe of what we did back then, but still manage to move forward with new sounds and new volume of Wu-Tang today, you know? That's what it was. At the end of the day, you know, Rizzo was a general, you know, teaching, teaching his recruits or whatever. I was a recruited cat, you know what I mean? But now I built my status up to become a general to where now he has to respect general to general now, you know? And um, he definitely came through and played his part, but we didn't want him to actually have to take on so much pressure, you know what I mean? And especially from coming off of the Eight Diagrams album, I wasn't really sure if I wanted him to really drive the boat all the way, you know what I mean? I felt like, you know, it ain't it ain't cool for that to happen right now. There was a little bit of turbulence, but it was still loyalty to the project we was we came with, you know what I mean? Because, you know, like I said, we real like that. We we curse each other out, and then the next day, it's on some, what's up, you ready to go get something to eat? You know what I mean? And you be looking at each other like, damn, nigga, you said, uh, you said the foulest shit in the world to me yesterday. And you got the nerve to walk up on me? Well, yeah, let's go get something to eat. And you know what I mean? That's how we operate as a normal, dysfunctional family. I felt like RZA just needed to come in and play his part to a degree. And I was gonna go out there and allow other powerful producers to come in as well and assist us with this part two thing. Because when you think of part two, you think of something different from part one. Now, the producers that I had involved in it, they looked at the whole project as being a science project. It became real serious to them. It wasn't just about, okay, yo, I'm giving a rapper a beat or, you know what I mean? And yo, it was like, yo, we're going to step into your world and make it the best that we see. So to me, that kind of like made me feel even 10 times more excited because now I've got brothers like Jay Diller coming, coming to the table, you know what I mean? Pete Rock, Marley Mall, you know what I mean? Marley, which is one of the illest producers, the top five producers, the same way everybody talk about the top five rappers in the game, dead or alive, you gotta talk about the top five producers, dead or alive, you know what I mean? And these dudes, you know, to me, they invented hip hop. You know what I mean? Pete Rock and all of them, you know, these are dudes that I grew up and I got my, my style and my swag from or whatever you wanna call it. You know, we learn from them. So we wanted them to be a part of the project, you know? So we wound up getting, you know, Dre. Dre got aboard, Jay Dilla, Pete Rock, the RZA. So I'm starting to look at the project like, this is going to be ugly right here, you know what I mean? So I just felt like that was going to make the part two project more interesting to really get at, you know? You know, you got a lot of fans out there that be like, yo, they may be from the West Coast, and they be like, yo, I want, I want Dre to get on a Dre beat, you know what I mean? So, you know, all I'm trying to do is just fulfill the, the things that, you know, my fans may feel is interesting, you know, and that's what we did. And, and we just wound up making a, an abomination that was beautiful, like a classic. This, this one right here, I got to say, is a, is a dinosaur piece right here. Real talk. Um, the Aftermath deal was never actually an Aftermath deal. It was a more or less an Aftermath word of mouth deal. 
you know, Dr. Dre was a good friend of Busta Rhymes, and you know, Busta was on Aftermath at the time. So Busta was kind of like one of my brothers that really was excited about me making Cuba Links too. Like, you know, if you talk to Busta, he make a movie out of every little thing he do and he say, you know? So he was really excited about, you know what I mean? Us talking about it. And I was like, yo, Busta, I'm thinking about doing this album because, you know, everybody is like, they, they now it's like, this shit is getting out of control. People really want this album. You know, I'm traveling into Germany and Belgium and here and everybody's just, constantly telling me with that album you know what i mean so he like yo you gotta do it i'm like yo i don't really know or whatever then you know he like yo you gotta do it so for some reason though you know what i mean i took heed to what he's saying but back to the dre thing he was the one that bridged the dre conversation so he was telling me how dre was a big fan and how dre wanted to you know get get me in the studio and be a part of the project so i'm like saying to myself that's perfect because you know, now we can finally get a Dre record with one of the Wu-Tang members on it, or whether it be just me, or it be me or Ghost, or somebody from the clan. Like, just the merging thing was ill to us. We got over to his studio. I brought a couple of things out. I met him, you know what I mean? Real cool, humble brother. You know, we started playing some things and all of that. And he was just going ballistic, you know what I mean? He was just like, yo, you ill, like you still got it. You you never lost it. You know, he asked me what, what's my situation. And at that time, I was still trying to get out of university because I felt like that wasn't the right home for me. You know, so I just told him, I kept it real with him. Like, yo, you know what I mean? It's funny you saying that because I'm trying to get off of these right now. I'm trying to get released because I don't feel like the, the marriage is there the right way with us. And he was like, yo, what's up? You know what I mean? I'm like, what's up? Like. You know what I mean? So, you know, we left it on that and we got back to talking about it again. And, you know, it was just a verbal agreement. It wasn't actually nothing in stone. And me, I can't go off of verbals. All I could go off is just what, what it's going to be and what it is. And it just seemed like everything was just being prolonged so much, you know, to where I didn't, I wasn't blaming him for it being so prolonged. It was just that, that that's what was happening. Terms wasn't met because of the timing and you know, I couldn't hold up what I was dealing with because I already was holding up for the longest. So, you know, I just decided to just keep it moving, you know, not take the offer for the, what it was because it wasn't big enough for me. And he didn't have the time, so I just felt like it wasn't a good move to make. But everything was word of mouth. My dad's like, you know, at least pull you aside, take that bass out of your voice. Call him, always call him sir, because what that dude is trying to do is get home safe to his family. He about nervous as hell pulling you over. I heard people talking about that verse before I heard it. And it was like, man, this new tribe, Fife, he coming, dude. Like, oh my God. Like, it fools was like amazed, actually. Like, it was the dopest verse they ever heard. You know, one of the original names I think we had was like Angels with Dirty Faces. We had all these different names. And, and Hank was just like, nah, you're the young black teenagers. And we were like, what? and your first record's gonna be proud to be black with our first song. I think some of that music is, is pretty harmful. Some of that hip hop music, strip club is sounding trap. I think it's harmful to kids, man. I don't think it's good for, for youngins, you know what I'm saying? I think the, the hip hop that we did in the 90s that we continue to do now, today, relevant and all of that, is the way to go.